Most writers dream of moving to New York City, but this one traveled around the world before settling in Lisbon instead. This is the story of finding home by leaving it. Sometimes childhood dreams come true, but not in the way you imagine. Passion is always worth the pursuit, but maybe work doesn't have to be so hard. Normally my entire day is just sitting here writing. But we won't end here. Hey, I'm Ellen, I'm an author, and I've been living in Lisbon for the last four years. I'm originally from Pittsburgh, but I moved here from New York City. I'm stubborn. <laughs> You need that to keep going in this industry because it is so tough and it's really hard to make a living at it. You have to really love it. Most of my stuff is fantasy. Lately I've been working on a thriller actually, which has been fun. That's a new genre for me. I read a lot of them, but I've never tried writing one before. I do a lot of outlining ahead of time because I like to kind of have the plot completely structured before I start drafting. So I'm trying to figure out the timeline because the story that I'm editing right now has there's kind of two concurrent timelines. There's the past and the current one, and I need to nail down the exact timing of the past timeline in order for the flashbacks in the current timeline to make sense. <laughs> when I'm writing, I like to really dig into the characters because I feel like I don't know the characters until I actually start writing them. So they kind of come through as I'm drafting and sometimes, sometimes it takes a while. <laughs> yeah, I have a pretty constant inner narrator, both in terms of writing and just daily life. It, kind of, it blew my mind when I learned that not everyone has this because mine is just so constant. I mean, I don't even, I don't know how to get it to shut up ever. I hear the sentences like almost before I'm writing them. In my head, the characters are like fully realized separate people, so they're not, I guess, a copy of any one person. I kind of take a lot of scenery and visual things from where I am. I think the people influence is more subconscious. So I started actually working at an, in, at an academic publisher doing the marketing. And I'd wanted to work in publishing just to kind of be close to the industry because eventually I always knew that I wanted to be a writer. And I thought that academic publishing would just kind of be a stepping stone and then I would switch to a fiction publisher. But I actually realized that since my priority was writing, it made more sense to stay at the academic publisher because in fiction publishing, you know, editors have so much take home work. You like you don't read the manuscript at work. You like read it at home after work and then at work is all the rest of the stuff that goes into publishing a book. And so the nice thing about working in academia and like nonfiction is that I could leave my work at the desk at the end of the day and then go home and do my writing. So it just gave me a little more personal space. I don't know any shortcuts. So it took me, I queried agents for four years. I sent out 198 query letters. I had multiple full manuscript and partial manuscript requests. Um, they were all rejected except for my last one, obviously, when I signed with my agent. And this was in, I think, 2012 or 13? I can't remember now. 13. Um, and then she and I worked together to revise the book that she signed me for. That one never wound up selling. So I worked on another one. We went out with that. And by, by went out with, I mean that my agent submitted it to publishers. Uh, no one was interested in that one. So I wrote another one and that one did actually sell in 2015. And then about six months later, the publisher that bought it announced that they were closing. Uh, so it never came out. That one got stuck back in the drawer. No one else bought it. <laughs> so it's really a roller coaster of an industry. And then my debut, what happened was, uh, I was again working with a book packager cause my agent had got me an audition for it and they really liked my pages. So I worked with them on a proposal. We worked on it for a year and then that was right before I left New York to go traveling. And I was about halfway into my first year of traveling when we sent that one out on submission and it wound up selling at auction, which was exciting. Um, 
normally if a book sells at auction, it means multiple publishers are interested. So there were three of them bidding on it. And it sold for 150,000, which is great. Um, since it was with, with a packager, they own 70% of the IP. So I got 30%, but 30% of 150 is still so much more than most people make from their debut novels. Like, I think the average advance for a novel is $7,500, <laughs> which is <laughs> obviously not live honorable. Um, so yeah, 30% of 150,000 was great. And then of course my agent takes 15%, but then you have to remember that that was paid out over three years. So it was still, it definitely helped, but obviously I needed the ghostwriting to, you know, subsist in the meantime. But it's, it's a shame because the industry used to be sustainable, you know, in like Stephen King's era, Neil Gaiman's era, when they were coming up, writers could make a living off of short stories. Like they were writing a short story a week, a short story a month, and you could live on that. And nowadays, I mean, it's impossible. Like short story markets are still paying what they were back in the seventies, eighties. It's like a hundred, two hundred dollars for a short story, maybe like a thousand. It's funny because I actually went full time before I even sold my first book because I had started doing ghostwriting on the side probably about four years before I left my day job. And so I was doing, I had a few different clients who were pretty regular. And so I was ghostwriting books for them. And I had a steady enough income from it that I realized I could afford to do it full time if I wasn't in New York City. So that was kind of when I left when I left the day job is the same time that I also gave up my apartment in New York, moved all of my stuff back to my mom's house or <laughs> like into a suitcase. And then, yeah, I went traveling around the world. I was traveling for like three years before I moved here and I wanted a home base again. And at first it was kind of a practical decision because Lisbon is close to the East Coast and my family are there. But once I got here, I fell in love with it. I definitely slowed down, which I needed. I mean, New York was perfect for my 20s, but you can burn out very easily in New York, and I think I was getting there toward the end of my stay, so it's nice to be in Lisbon, which is a much more relaxed, laid-back atmosphere. It's just, life is easier. In New York, I would wake up in Astoria, bring my iPad, get on the train to reverse commute because my office was in Hoboken. And because I was reverse commuting, I usually got a seat on the train. So I would try to write on my iPad on the way to and from work because I was about 45 minutes of writing time. At work, obviously, I was just, you know, day job the whole day. Sometimes at lunch, I would try and do a writing break. And then in the evenings, I would usually stop halfway home and go to East Village. One of my friends owned a tea house there. So I'd do some writing there or sometimes bar hop with other writer friends and do a lot of writing. It was nice because New York has such a huge literary scene. So I had a lot of writer friends. We did kind of, you know, critique groups and writings and meetups to just get work done. So in that way, it was inspiring, but it was also just a lot of kind of cramming work into literally every spare moment that you have, <laughs> um, which definitely can lead to burnout. <laughs> I do feel like I learned some useful lessons, though, because now I can kind of write anywhere with any tool that I have. So now it's more, you know, I start with reading in the morning and then write my own stuff. Usually I write best between like 10 a.m. and 3 p.m., but I can really write any time of day if I need to. So I'll try to write my own stuff sort of in the morning or late morning. <laughs> and then in the afternoon, I'll switch to writing client projects. I like to write around people if I can, because sometimes it's such a solitary business. I'm just, it's just me in here with my computer. So sometimes I need to kind of jog my brain and it helps to go right at a cafe or right at a bar, just be like around other humans while I'm in my little fantasy world. <laughs> 
Some of my favorite spots are Fable is a new English bookstore and cafe that opened. I love writing in their bookstore or out on their terrace. I really love the Miradora de Alcantara just for the view. It's really inspiring. And a lot of times there's performers playing there or people selling art. There's a little cafe there and I'll write because they have the view in the background. I'll normally write for like five or six hours a day and then, you know, go for a walk, maybe get a vino at the kiosk. I love Jardim Prince Royal. It's nice to go to the farmer's market every Saturday. In Portuguese, some fritigas in English, they're nettles. So you can make like tea with them or use them in soup but they sting you if you touch them. I love the trees there. There's this really giant one that they had to build a cage to kind of support it. I like kind of sitting under there, reading for a bit. In the evenings, Black Sheep is my favorite wine bar. They're, it's really sociable and they have a lot of unique Portuguese wines, so it's nice to be able to try a lot of different things and meet new people. In terms of more kind of party atmosphere, I like Marvila 8 and Beato in general. I say Portugal is more laid back about some things, but they do kind of, they base most decisions here off of your monthly salary and they expect everyone to have kind of a work contract and a regular income. So when you have people like me that don't have that, for example, getting my visa was a little tricky. I had to kind of put in I did show way more in the bank than you normally would have to because I didn't have the regular monthly salary. I make money each month, but it really varies wildly. Like it'll be like $10 one month and 5,000 the next, you know, it's not steady. So I had to jump through a lot more hoops when it came to the visa. And then I was lucky enough last year, last summer to be able to buy my own apartment which is incredible. I never thought I would be able to do that on a writing, you know, income. And that was tricky too. I went to eight different banks and I have, you know, all of the prerequisites in order and only one bank would give me an offer. And it was, you know, not the best offer you could get, but it was doable. So you only need one yes. <laughs> But yeah, it's definitely a little trickier being freelance here, I would say, than being like a salaried employee. It's too hard to give up the freedom, you know, working for yourself and setting for your own hours. I mean, that can be tricky at times because when I had a day job, at least I had a set routine, you know, so I knew exactly what I was doing each day. And that did kind of help build the rest of your life around it versus, you know, when it it's totally up to you. You can wind up kind of getting lost in the weeds and not really structure yourself well. But at the end of the day, the freedom is just, it's great. I mean, I can write anywhere, be anywhere. <laughs> I don't love Hemingway in general, but I do love this one quote of his, which is either write something worth reading or do something worth writing. And I love that.